RG, professor of economics and professor of political science at the University of California uh, at Berkeley, where he's taught since 1987. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a research associate of the NDER. Uh, he's uh, been a research, he's a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research in London. He's been a senior policy advisor at the IMF. Uh, he's currently a chair of the Academic Advisory uh, Committee of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Professor Eichengree is also the immediate past president of the Economic History Association. He's received numerous <coughs> awards, both for scholarship and teaching in economic history. Uh, ten months ago, when uh, we arranged various visits, uh, we, or certainly I, had no idea how topical this talk this evening would be. The current financial situation in Europe has dominated financial and economic news for uh, several months now. Uh, it's been particularly acute over the last few weeks. Uh, it's now uh, a daily news item that we all see. Uh, so, Professor Eichengreen is ideally positioned to think through the current European sovereign debt crisis. He's been writing about related issues for decades. His 1992 book, Golden Fetters, concerned the gold standard and the Great Depression. His 2002 book, Financial Crises and What to Do About Them, seems prescient in its timing. His most recent book, published earlier this year, is titled Exorbitant Privilege, the Rise and Fall of the Dollar and the Future of the International Monetary System. His recent research and policy papers include the work on uh, public debt, uh, housing, international policy coordination, and so on. And Professor Eichengreen is also a frequent contributor to columns and op-ed pieces. In short, Professor Eichengreen is one of the world's foremost experts on the international monetary system and global finance. I cannot think of anyone better to discuss the current economic situation in Europe. Please join with me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Professor Barry Eichengreen. So thank you, George. Um, everyone can hear me? This is on. Thank you for the um, over-kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming out on a, on a wet evening. Um, if you didn't come out on wet evenings, <laughs> you'd have a very quiet life, I suppose. Anyway, it's, it's good to see everyone uh, here tonight. Um, what I want to do is to Presentations like this, I think, are, are good for the speaker to try to figure out whether he really understands the events that are unfolding so rapidly around us. So what I'm uh, going to do tonight really comes in three parts. How did we come to this point where Europe is in, in, engulfed in a gigantic financial crisis that is affecting American financial markets, the American economy as well, the global economy for that matter? where we're now going, uh, where, where we, how we got here, where we are now, and where we're going. So there is a conventional narrative uh, uh, about the origins uh, of the European crisis, that southern Europeans are spendthrift. They live beyond their means. And there is an accurate narrative. Southern Europeans are spendthrift. <laughs> they live beyond their means. But they're not all spendthrift in the same way. And importantly, someone lent them all that money. And that's uh, a critical part of the story as well. So I have uh, a couple of ways that we can try to understand the origins or, or the genesis of the crisis. So with help, let me show you the first. Europe said the agreement. We 
to give you the money you need, but you have to change your ways. But the Greeks are not good at changing their ways. They had the same coffee cup design for 5,000 years. <laughs> but it's too easy to just blame the Greeks. I also want to blame everyone who thought lending the Greeks money was a good idea. You don't even have to go to Europe to see that Greeks are bad with money. Just go to a Greek diner here in New York. Two people eating, 14 people working, and you can get a turkey sandwich the size of a dictionary for $3. It's not a solid business plan. <laughs> what do you expect from a country whose main export is doctor's office cleaning? <laughs> it's a yogurt-based economy. The only thing that works together is Greece's eyebrows. <laughs> So that's the, uh, the entertaining part, <laughs> the um, humorous but um, vaguely sober part, one way of understanding the crisis. Uh, here then is another, here's, here's an economist's way of understanding it. So where did this crisis in Europe come from? It came from some of the unintended or unexpected financial consequences of the creation of the euro and the adoption of uh, a single European currency by first 12, 12 and now 17 European countries starting in uh, 1999. So in, 19, in 1999, indeed before that, different European countries were regarded as more, more or less risky, depending. They had very different borrowing costs depending on the state of their economy, what people thought their inflation rate was likely to be, what people thought their economic and financial uh, prospects were. With the creation uh, of the euro, uh, countries that had previously had very high borrowing costs, read Greece uh, in orange at the top, although you can see that the uh, phenomenon was more general, found themselves able to borrow at the same low rates uh, uh, of interest uh, as, for example, rock-solid Germany. So it's not clear why this should have been the case, why people uh, were so willing to lend so freely at such low interest rates to the Greek government, but they were, and they were willing to lend to governments and households and companies uh, across southern Europe at low German interest rates. Someone evidently believed in the convergence theory, the idea that the poor economies of southern Europe that started out behind would grow rapidly and their levels of income would converge to those in Germany and, and, and more generally the northern European core. So the lower cost of, of borrowing that I showed you in the previous slide encouraged in effect a big party across southern Europe. It was easy to borrow at, at a low interest rate um, and the result of that was uh, more spending, 
and less saving across southern Europe. You see that in, in the case of Spain, Greece, and Portugal, and the honorary member of southern Europe, Ireland, in green. Um, you don't see it in, in Germany, of course. You see the opposite, the thrifty Germans saving even more as the decade progressed. So to repeat, someone had to lend the southern Europeans all that money. And you can see from the yellow line at the top who that was. It wasn't all or even mainly the government, so people talk about the European uh, debt crisis now as a sovereign or government debt crisis. Uh, part of the, uh, a large part of the fiesta was in the private sector. There was a, 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 a boom after 1999 in private real consumption spending in Ireland and Greece and Spain in Portugal. They borrowed from Germany and more broadly uh, externally in order, in order to spend. And you can see the Germans uh, again behaving very differently at the bottom of this figure. But it wasn't all consumption. There was also a lot of investment spending. Not all of that investment was productive, so a lot of the investment was, like in the United States before 2007, in residential real estate in Spain and, and in Ireland. Uh, in particular, we know with benefit of hindsight that not all that in, in, in investment was productive. And Firms in these countries, for, for their part, could pass through higher production costs because domestic spending and domestic uh, demand for what they were producing was so strong. So you see uh, here a, a measure of, uh, a, a, of labor costs, uh, uh, the, the cost of producing one unit of, of output in manufacturing going up in Greece, going up in Portugal, going up in Spain not in Germany, and interestingly, not in Ireland. So this is a, a, a first indication that Ireland is kind of a, a special case where they indulged big time in one of the excesses uh, of the last decade, namely uh, they had a big housing boom, but some of the other problems that uh, developed across southern Europe that costs spiraled out of control, productivity failed to keep up, that was not part of Ireland's problem. And that divergence in, in, in the cost of production between Northern Europe and Southern Europe uh, in turn made for a, a divergence in competitiveness. So the countries whose costs were going up had to mark up the prices of, of what they produced and sold. Their exports stagnated. You can see that at the uh, bottom of the figure while uh, once again behavior in, in, in Germany was quite different. And once again, Ireland looks like um, something of a special case. So it is tempting on this basis to blame those uh, spendthrift Southern Europeans who failed to save over, over the course of the last decade. But again, when you look at the two, you look at the whole figure, you're reminded it takes two to tango. Someone had to lend them all that money, and you can see from the yellow line who, in large part, it was. With hindsight, then, the story is clear. There was the false belief, starting in 1999, that monetary union guaranteed fast growth in the Euro area periphery, um, southern Europe and Ireland. It eliminated uh, sovereign risk, which means the risk that a government will default on its debts, and that uh, uh, the the elimination of sovereign risk and the expectation of fast growth in the Euro area periphery encouraged reckless lending to these countries. Um, the same be belief in the Euro area periphery itself led to reckless spending. The result was over leveraged banks at the center, which means France <coughs> and Germany, and a loss of competitiveness at, at, at the periphery. And then Europe had the bad luck that it was battered by a global financial crisis that originated in, in the United States with uh, problems in the subprime market and the derivatives markets and, and so forth. The European expectation was that they could proceed with monetary union and then over a period of time they could build a European treasury. They could move to fiscal union as well as monetary union. They could move to deeper, they could move to political union so that these new institutions 
would be held properly accountable, that they would perhaps have 20 or 30 years to complete the process. Uh, all of that was profoundly derailed by the crisis they experienced starting in 2008 that widened their government budget deficits, that vastly increased their, their debt burdens, that damaged their prospects for economic growth, and that of course left no time to complete the process. So where we are now, this part of the talk basically comes in uh, one slide. We're in a situation where the interest rates that European governments uh, have to pay investors in order to issue debt to finance their ongoing budget deficits have exploded. So this figure is a couple of weeks old and it is way out of date. These uh, spreads continue to rocket upward in a way that creates real doubts about the solvency of uh, not only the Greek government but uh, the governments uh, of Portugal, Ireland, and Spain. And, of course, the government of Italy. So Greece is about 2% of the euro area economy. It accounts for 2% of the GDP of the combined 17 countries that have the euro. Italy is about 18% of the euro area economy. So Italy is the, the, the big cannoli. What is happening in Greece is a disaster, especially a disaster for the Greek people, but it's a, a disaster that the rest of Europe can in principle be fenced off from. In principle, yes, in practice, perhaps. But Italy is so big, so important to Europe, so connected to the rest of the European economy, that there's no way it can be fenced off. So um, the yield on 10-year on government bonds in Italy is now on the order of 7%. With a 3% nominal rate of growth uh, of income in Italy and a debt-to-GDP ratio well above 1, the debt-to-GDP ratio in, in, in Italy is 120%, there's no way that this arithmetic can add up. They have to pay way more on their debt than they can afford because the debt burden grows faster than the economy. It, it's a big national Ponzi scheme. If the nominal interest rate so exceeds the nominal rate of growth of the economy. So you can square that circle in, in, in principle by reducing the debt burden, by not issuing more and retiring some of the debt that's outstanding. So if Italy runs a, a budget surplus net of interest payments of 4 to 5% a year, it can retire debt fast enough to remain solvent. But it's not clear that politically Italy, or, or for that matter, any country can move from what have until very recently been substantial budget deficits to a very large surplus. Think of all the public programs you would have to cut whether Italy can do that overnight. And Italy is the third largest uh, economy in the Eurozone, is uh, too big to fail, but it could also be too big to, to save. It's not clear that the institutions of the, of the European Union have the capacity to um, prevent Italy from lapsing into default, and I'll come back to that um, in a few minutes. So all of this begs the question of why now? I told you a story in the first few slides of a process that unfolded over the course of a decade, starting in 1999, and then big problems that began to develop starting in 2008. But here we are in, in the late months of 2011. Why now rather than last year or the year before, or for that matter, next year? So, when I ask myself that question, I think about a variety uh, uh, of technical factors at play. So, Bunga Bunga is, is you know, one of Berlusconi's favorite phrases. He became increasingly incapable of governing his country. The European crisis is, is now, first and foremost, an Italian crisis. He was unable, to, uh, unwilling to push through painful measures of austerity and adjustment and get Italy back on the track toward insolvency because, as we saw in the video before, he had other things on his mind. That could have been the problem. There was a, a, a decision in October that 
at some level was wise. Um, part of the problem in Europe is that the banks are weak and they weren't force-fed new capital in the same way U.S. banks were after 2008. So uh, if Greek debt is restructured as it will be, banks in Europe hold a lot of those Greek bonds. They will suffer losses and people will worry about the stability of the banks. You have to bulletproof the banks against those problems by requiring them to raise more capital. The, the, so this fact was acknowledged in October, which was a good thing, but there wasn't a decision made to force feed the bank's capital to inject uh, public funds into the banks. Rather, uh, politicians in, in Europe told the banks, you can increase your capital adequacy ratio any way you want. What does capital adequacy ratio means, mean? It means how adequate is your capital relative to your assets, to your investments? How high is the ratio of your own funds, your, your liquid funds, relative to your loans and investments in bonds, some of which may, may go bad? You need an adequate cushion against losses on those investments. So one way to uh, uh, increase your capital to asset ratio is by raising more capital, issuing more public equity, if you can find anybody to buy it. So that's why Chinese banks and others have been sniffing around Europe recently. The other problem with that besides who, who's going to invest in European banks at the moment is that this dilutes the existing shareholders. People who hold stock in those European banks are going to have to share the profits with the new stockholders if the banks uh, raise capital by I issuing additional shares. So they don't want to do that. How do they raise their capital to asset ratio if they don't want to, want to issue more capital? They run down the assets, right? They stop lending or they sell off the southern European bonds that they already have in their portfolios. So that could have been another factor that brought the crisis to a head. Now, finally, banks and others in Europe thought that they could buy insurance on their bonds, credit default swaps, in other words. And uh, the way that the restructuring has been done in, in, in Greece is expressly designed not to trigger those credit default swaps, not to cause them to pay out. So. An end run was done uh, around the insurance policy. European bonds have been revealed to be riskier than people understood previously. That could be another reason why there is, is a, a sell-off in the market and yields on these bonds are, are spiking. A, a, a fourth technical factor could be panic, that you know in, in investors sell because other people sell, and we could be in one of those periods now. My own view I, I, is that there are good fundamental reasons why the crisis has uh, grown more severe at this point in time, which is that the European economy has stopped growing. That we, we know that economic conditions are, are, are tough across the advanced economies. Um, across Europe, governments are engaged in austerity measures. They're cutting public spending and, and in some cases raising taxes. Growth is grinding to a halt. And if you can't grow the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio, you have to shrink the numerator and, and that's very, very hard to do. Investors realize that and that's why I think the markets have reacted uh, as they have. So what to do? There are a number of alternatives on the table. None of them are very uh, attractive. Uh, there's an alphabet soup now of alternatives. So there was plan A, which was austerity. If these governments can only balance their budgets, stop issuing more debt, and even better move their budgets into surplus and retire some of the excessive debt that they have injected into the market, um, everything will calm down and everything will be well. Plan B is uh, debt restructuring. Maybe uh, it's, it won't be possible to pay off these debts after all, and in some cases like that of Greece, uh, the, the debt will have to be written down to uh, 79 cents on the euro. They have cents as well. Or 50 cents on the euro. 
or 10 cents on the euro. Time will tell. Plan C would be break up the, uh, the monetary union. Part of the problem for Greece is that it can't uh, restore its competitiveness by devaluing its own currency. It doesn't have its own currency. So adopting the euro in, in 2001 was a mistake for Greece. The argument would go, why not roll the clock back and solve the problem in that way? Plan D is uh, a quantum leap in, in European integration, move to a European federation, and in that way, uh, the continent can solve all its problems. And plan E is that the European Central Bank needs to step in. So what I want to do now uh, is to walk through these five options and give you at least my sense of how I think things are going to play out. So plan A is, uh, as I explained, austerity. Uh, it's to rely on government spending cuts and tax increases to bring down the burden of indebtedness. Uh, so governments are uh, increasing the retirement age to reduce expected future uh, uh, government spending on pensions. Uh, the Italians have been brave and, and uh, committed to increasing the retirement age by two years, by 2025. Um, <laughs> This strategy relies on, on privatization uh, of public enterprises, uh, of telecommunications companies and, and the Postal Service and, and others to boost uh, revenues one time and more generally to uh, uh, eliminate soft budget constraints, to eliminate a situation where the post office runs a deficit and the government has to step in again and again and give it more revenues. Uh, uh, part of this is the adoption of balanced budget rules at the national level where they don't exist. They call them debt breaks in Europe to, as a way of, of credibly restraining future spending. Um, labor and product market reforms and uh, reductions in, in labor costs to enhance competitiveness, restore competitiveness and, and boost growth, and more generally stronger oversight at the level of the European Union by the EU's proto-executive branch, uh, the European Commission, not just of national fiscal policies, something which they ostensibly have in place at the, no at the moment, but also more effective oversight of other policies affecting growth and competitiveness uh, at the national level. So that sounds admirable and it seems to make sense. What are the problems with Plan A? Uh, uh, we know uh, by now. Government spending cuts and tax increases uh, only uh, uh, depress growth in the short run, which only depresses government revenues and widens the budget deficit, the whole purpose of this exercise being to narrow the, the budget deficit. Privatization is politically difficult and time-consuming. It doesn't help very much in the short run, and the crisis at the moment is all about the short run. Pro-growth reforms like may, making it easier to lay off redundant workers uh, are, are likely to only uh, depress growth in the short run. What's their immediate uh, effect? Firms lay off redundant workers who don't have a paycheck and they, they don't spend. So even if these policies will enhance labor market flexibility and economic flexibility in the long run, they, they have perverse effects in the short run. Deep recessions lead to political backlash and threaten to topple the governments implementing the austerity measures. And, and markets look forward to this possibility. They see the writing on the wall, so interest rates uh, go up rather than down, and debt burdens go up rather than down as a result of uh, these austerity measures. So you've got to do something else, and, and that leads to Plan B, which uh, was first tabled uh, really last summer, which is to add to austerity the restructuring of uh, uh, debts where they are no longer viable, where there is no prospect that through austerity alone uh, they can, can uh, uh, be repaid. So the idea is to write down the, uh, the government debt of uh, Greece on a voluntary basis, the old, old plan was by, uh, uh, the headline figure was 21%, the new plan, the headline figure is uh, 
And with this concession, the government uh, doesn't have to raise taxes simply to pay the bondholders. Um, with this ki kind of uh, debt relief, the country's debt to GDP ratio will fall to what is supposed to be a more manageable level of 120% pause by 2020. So problems with plan B, you'll see the illustration is pretty similar to the <laughs> illustration that accompanied plan A. Um, a 50% reduction, technical term for, for a, a reduction on the burden of, of the debt is a haircut. Um, on only that two-thirds of the debt held by private investors, uh, a third of the debt is now held by the, is owed to the International Monetary Fund or to uh, uh, Greece's European Union partners. Uh, a 50% haircut on two-thirds uh, uh, of the debt is in fact only a 33% debt reduction. Much uh, uh, of that debt is in fact held by domestic Greek banks, all of which are going to be bankrupted if the debt is writ written down significantly. They're, they're going to have to be stabilized. More public funds are going to have to be injected in into those banks so they can reopen their doors. Where is that money going to com come from? 120% of GDP is not, in fact, manageable for an economy that may not start to grow again for another three years, even according to the International Monetary Fund. Even bigger, I don't know if the right word for haircuts, even more severe uh, haircuts on Greek debt, which will be coming, will mean uh, bigger losses for French and German banks, which are already being asked to raise on the order of a, a 100 billion euros worth of new capital to prepare themselves for losses on, on their holdings uh, of Greek debt. So it, what's the idea here? Is the idea that Portugal, Spain, Ireland, and Italy should also adopt Plan B? They should also restructure their debt in this way? What that, would that mean for the European banking system? What, what would that mean for the U.S. banking system? Uh, U.S. bank shares ha have plummeted in the last couple of weeks, you may have noticed. That has more than a little bit to do with uh, what's going on in, in Europe at the moment. So that leads people to say we have to add to the mix to the austerity which uh, is unavoidable in countries like Greece that have been living vastly beyond their means. And we have to add to the debt restructuring which is unavoidable given that these, some of these countries are insolvent. We have to give them back their own currencies. They have to uh, exit from the euro area. Greece, for example, would reintroduce the drachma and then it would lower the value of the drachma against uh, the euro. So uh, a, a very prominent German economist in Munich, Hans Werner Sinn, has said the, the Greek economy is not very uh, different from the Turkish economy. This has not made Mr. Sinn very popular in <laughs> Athens. So he, he, he says we need to lower Greek costs to Turkish levels. That could be accomplished by, by depreciating the new drachma against the euro by 44%. That would make Greek exports of uh, olive oil and, and feta and wine and other things more competitive on international markets. It would make Greek islands much more uh, attractive and eco economical as tourist resorts. The Greek economy could begin to grow again on the basis of these exports of merchandise and services. The unemployment rate would begin to come down. The political backlash against the policies uh, of austerity would begin to die down and with growth social stability would return, financial uh, solvency would return. So it seems pretty straightforward that part of the solution here ought to be uh, uh, the crisis countries exiting from the euro area. So problems with plan C. Here uh, I, I cannot resist uh, a personal note. In early 2007 I was asked by a couple of Euro European colleagues uh, to write uh, a paper for a conference and a volume. So you can see the volume here. Europe and the Euro, it was called University of Chicago Press 2010. Publication lags in academia are very long. But the, I wrote this article in 2007 and they asked me to write about the breakup of, of the Euro area before the subprime crisis in the United States, before troubles in Europe. 
I sat back and thought about what the consequences of a country like Greece leaving the Euro area might be. Um, and I concluded uh, it would be a, an unmitigated disaster and therefore it would not happen. So rarely do academics have the, uh, the privilege of a real-time test of their <laughs> theories, which I, I certainly have here. So what, what, what did I argue in that article? Uh, I, I argued that reintroducing your national currency when you're part of a monetary union is not exactly straightforward. To start with, this would be a policy decision that would have to be undertaken have to be taken by the Greek parliament. We've seen a lot of the Greek parliament uh, in the last couple of weeks. Greece is the world's, arguably, the, the world's oldest democracy. There would um, be a parliamentary debate and it would be televised, of course. So you're uh, a student in, 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 in Greece or you're a worker in Greece and you hear that your parliament is debating the possibility uh, of uh, reintroducing the drachma and converting your wages and savings from euros to drachmas with the express purpose of reducing their value by 44% relative to their prior value in euros. So what would you do on the first minute you heard that this possibility was even being remotely contemplated? Answer is clear, you'd wire all your money to Frankfurt. So this would be the uh, most uh, extreme banking panic and banking crisis the world has ever seen. I think the, the, the phrase I used in, in this article in 2007 was this would be the mother of all financial crises. So all the money would be withdrawn from Greek banks uh, in the first minute. The banks would close. Foreign lenders to Greek businesses would can cancel their credit lines for fear that they would only get 56% of their money back after the uh, drachma was reintroduced and depreciated against the euro. The stock market would close, the bond market would close, capital controls, controls on your ability to get money, your euro banknotes out of the country would be imposed and border patrols would be dispatched uh, to enforce them. There would be a crisis of confidence in the new drachma which would plunge against the euro. Inflation would soar as people rushed to the stores to get rid of their, their new drachmas and to buy cans of soup. Instead, uh, legal disputes would erupt. For example, as a German bank's loan to the Greek subsidiary, subsidiary of BMW, now still a loan denominated in euros, or is this loan now denominated in new drachma, where the subsidiary can pay back the, the bank in Frankfurt in drachma rather than euros? So these questions would be adjudicated. That's the polite way of saying they would be tied up in courts for years and your favorite judge would get to decide whether he wanted to bankrupt the Greek subsidiary by keeping the obligation in euros or bankrupt the German financial institution by uh, um, allowing them to be converted into new drachma. Parenthetically, I, 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 again, I've asked some of my European friends, whose courts exactly would decide in a case like this? And, and the answer is it depends whether it's an affiliate or a subsidiary, is it gonna be a German court or a Greek court? It, it would be messy. Um, banks in other countries with exposure to Greece that had lent money to Greece or, or bought Greek government bonds uh, are, would, would then, questions would be asked about their stability. No one would lend to them. They would be locked out of the market where, where they borrow overnight from other banks, which is an important way that banks uh, square their balance sheets on a day-to-day -day basis. Since no one would be sure who was solvent and who was insolvent financially, the uh, entire interbank market would seize up. Bank lending across the European Union would cease. Economic activity would be halted. And then there would be the contagion that people, the, the problem that people would say, well, if Greece is talking about this today, Portugal is gonna talk about it tomorrow. And Spain the day after tomorrow, and Italy the day after that, where would it stop. So you may think, think I exaggerate when I tell this story to some people they think I exaggerate. I don't, I don't think so. I think uh, Lehman Brothers was disruptive. This would be Lehman Brothers squared. So that's what I, I, what I concluded in, in my 
article in 2007 was that the economic, short run economic costs would be so great, the financial calamity would be so disruptive that European leaders would not allow this to happen. They would do whatever it took to prevent this kind of cat catastrophe from occurring. So I continue to believe that that's what rational uh, politicians and economic policymakers would do. They would see how catastrophic the collapse of, of the Euro area or even the unilateral exit of one country from the Euro would be and they would do what it, whatever it, it, it took to prevent that. What I've been reminded of and, and you all knew of course but uh, uh, an economist forgot was that politicians don't always opt rationally for the lowest cost option. Unexpected things can happen and uh, all I can say about that is uh, if uh, this kind of unexpected thing happens, batten down the hatches. Germany is a different case, of course. Germany is the one country that could in principle re-exit from the euro area and reintroducing, reintroduce its own currency without experiencing this kind of financial crisis. Everybody would expect that the new Deutschmark would strengthen against the euro because Germany is such a, uh, has a strong economy and, and solid finances. Everybody would move their money into the German stock market and into German banks in the expectation of making money rather than uh, the opposite. There's considerable disenchantment about the euro, euro in, in, in Germany and if not a new Deutschmark, what about it, uh, a new northern European euro uh, instead in which uh, Germany and uh, the Netherlands and I guess at this point in time that would be about it, Finland, <laughs> exit the, the, the euro area together and, and, and uh, in, in, in introduce uh, a new northern European mark. So there was a scandalous story last week on Reuters that said actually uh, some of the Europeans had been talking about this. I say scandalous because it, it was apparently untrue. Problems with that variant uh, of Plan C Germany exiting from, from the euro area and people expecting that the rump euro, what was left, would then fall apart, would create all the same chaos in Greece, in Portugal, in Spain, in Italy as the other scenario that I, I described to you. Could Germany prosper while the rest of Europe was in a crisis? German exports would presumably collapse as the new Deutschmark soared against the euro. So I show you a Swiss franc here because this is the problem that Switzerland as a safe haven currency has been uh, experiencing until very, very recently. Would the collapse uh, of the euro mean the collapse uh, of the European Union and the broader project of economic and political integration that has been underway in Europe ever since World War II? So this is Berlin in 1945 at the bottom. The idea of European integration is really central, I would argue, to German political culture and uh, regaining monetary autonomy in their own currency at the price of destroying the European project, I continue to believe is too high a price for European leaders to contemplate. So people said, have said repeatedly, Mrs. Merkel is a different kind of German chancellor than her predecessor. She grew up in the old East Germany. She was schooled differently. She wasn't schooled to believe that European integration is uh, uh, of the highest value. I think that reading of her motives and uh, of German political culture is wrong. That she does believe that and, and Germans more broadly attach a, a, a very, very high value to keeping the, the larger European project going. So that brings us to, to plan, plan D, which is moving forward to much deeper European integration, creating a European federation, if you will. So I show you here this European, this French technocrat from the 1950s, Jean Monnet, sometimes referred to as the father of European integration. So one of the statements that he's known for is, Europe is forged in crises and the Europe we see today is the product of the crises with which Europe has dealt in the past. So his point is whenever there is a crisis, whenever there is a critical 
juncture, Europe is faced with the decision of whether to go back to nationalism or to go forward to deeper integration. And at every point in time, until now, it's gone forward. So if history is any guide, it may go forward again. What would going forward mean uh, in this context? It would mean that European countries collectively assume responsibility for uh, their, their government debts. So they convert Italian government bonds and whatever Greek government bonds remain after the restructuring and Spanish government bonds and German government bonds into euro bonds, the equivalent of US treasury bonds, and then their respective governments uh, assume, each of them assumes individually and jointly responsibility for the, that entire debt. A quantum leap in European integration would involve uh, creating a system of fiscal federalism like we have in the United States, where tax revenues are transferred via, in the US via Washington DC, from booming states, which pay more taxes, to depressed states, which don't, uh, a, a form of, of insurance against the kind of southern European problem, booming northern Europe, depressed southern Europe problem that they have at the moment. A quantum leap in European in integration would mean regulating European banks at the level of the European Union. So part of the reason Europe got into this problem is that French bank regulators didn't care a whit what the behavior of French banks implied for the Greek economy. So if French banks wanted to lend a, a bunch of money to Greece, if French regulators thought that was good for the French banks, they didn't care what it meant for the Greek economy. So those kind of effects, externalities, would be the, uh, the, the technical term, can be internalized, can be taken care of by shifting regulation up to the level of uh, the European Union. And ultimately, if you're going to have a powerful bank regulator at the level of the EU, if you're going to have a European treasury to uh, undertake these fiscal transfers at the level of the EU, if you're going to have euro bonds, you need a European political system to hold those powerful entities accountable. You need a, a political union uh, to hold them accountable and, and, and to make the key uh, decisions at the level of the, the monetary union. So what are the problems with Plan D? Germans think of themselves as Germans, not as Europeans. We're all Americans, right? Um, we don't think about ourselves to a first approximation, I write here, as Oregonians or Californians. We think of our, ourselves as Americans. We're all in this together, and if we have an economic crisis, we're all going to dig deep and do something about it. There's powerful resistance to that idea within Europe. Germans view the crisis as a morality play, this same morality play of Southern Europeans who are irresponsible and can't live within their means. And, and why should we be, be in a fiscal union and a political union with those guys? Uh, and even if there were to be agreement on the, the principle of adding fiscal union and political union to the monetary union, it would take many years, it would take 27 countries, some in, in, in some of which the national parliament would have to ratify all the relevant legal changes in others like the UK uh, there would be a referendum on ratification to, to make it happen. And it would take years, it'll take decades, rather than the period of weeks or months Europe has to resolve the crisis. So that leaves plan E, which is the two Marios. Uh, uh, Mario Draghi, the MIT uh, economist, who's the, the head of the European Central Bank at the top, and Mario Monti, the new uh, prime minister, in Italy, the Yale economist at the bottom. So how would Plan E work? It would start with the European Central Bank giving countries time to get their houses in order. So the European Central Bank, let, let me focus on Italy as an example, although the point is more general, the European Central Bank would buy Italian bonds big time through an existing facility, its so-called security market program. It can push Italian bond prices up to any level it wants if it buys enough of them. 
And by pushing the prices up, it pushes the yields down. That gives the Italian government some breathing space where its finances are not continually deteriorating. And Mario number two at the bottom uses that breathing space to get agreement on pro-growth reforms, labor market reforms, product market reforms, privatization, uh, um, pension reform, and so forth, all the things needed to eventually get the Italian economy growing again. The markets are, are, are reassured, and if the markets are reassured, they're going to be willing to buy Italian debt again at uh, lower interest rates. At this point, the European Central Bank can stop buying Italian bonds. It can exit the market. It can sell back into the market some of the bonds that it bought previously, and it can sell those bonds back into the market at a profit. It bought them when the prices were low. Today, once everybody is re reassured that all is well, it can sell the bonds at, at, at a profit. None of this uh, needs to be inflationary. None of it needs to damage the European Central Bank's balance sheet. None of, none of it requires the German taxpayer to pony up more money to recapitalize the European Central Bank. In fact, the European Central Bank has been buying the bonds of Italy, Spain, um, Portugal, and Ireland uh, at an accelerating rate. And you can see the greatly accelerating rate starting in, in August, the latest phase uh, of the crisis here. That hasn't added anything noticeable to European inflation because the European money supply hasn't grown. When the European Central Bank has bought <coughs> Italian bonds, it's with cash, it's neutralized the effect of that. It's sterilized its purchases by selling German bonds from its portfolio. So there's been no increase in European money supply. There's been no inflation. Um, I, I would ask parenthetically, I shall return to this, would a little bit of inflation be such a bad thing for Europe under, under present circumstances? But the problem here is that the European Central Bank only has so many AAA rated bonds, so many German and Dutch and Finnish government bonds uh, in its closet, and it will run out of bonds to sell back into the market. It'll no longer be able to sterilize its bond purchases um, come the new year. And then the question becomes, what will the European Central Bank do? Will it stop supporting peripheral European bond markets? Well, maybe not. So, you know, uh, the securities sterilized bond purchases were supposed to be the European Central Bank's bazooka. Maybe it also has heavier artillery, which is quantitative easing. It can buy these bonds without sterilizing the impact on the money supply. Nothing in its statute prevents it from doing so. The European Central Bank, in, in, in fact, stepped into the market big time yesterday and bought, uh, it is said by, by, by people who are supposed to know, something like 2 billion euros worth of Italian and Spanish bonds in, in one day, which by the standard of, of this figure, it's bought about um, 180 billions worth over a period of, uh, of months. That, that's pretty significant. Um, and it was able to bring Italian uh, uh, spreads down at, at least temporarily. So maybe that's what the European Central Bank is going to do now. Buy the bonds of the troubled countries big time without sterilizing the impact on the money supply and give those governments the breathing space they need to put the relevant reforms in place. All of this, of course, is strongly resisted in, in Germany because in, in Germany the belief is inflation is always just around the corner. So the German newspapers, um, which, which I read when I have the stomach, are always talking about this episode at the top, the hyperinflation in, in 1922 when people had to take wheelbarrows full of currency down to the store in order to buy groceries. So French and German leaders are, aren't now visibly fighting about what the European Central Bank should do. The crisis has arrived on France's doorstep, and, and the French finance minister, minister of finances and economy, says the European Central Bank needs to ramp up its support for the troubled economies. And uh, German, uh, the head of the German Bundesbank says, 
Absolutely not, because inflation is just around the corner, and uh, this is at risk of getting out of hand. So the, the French-German alliance has been at the center of the European project. It's, it's, it, uh, Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Sarkozy have been the key players in trying to bring it under control. If they're now about to openly start, start fighting about this question, what's going to happen next? So uh, there are a couple of more questions I want to ask about this, and then I will stop. Is it already too late for this kind of intervention by the European Central Bank to help? So European government bonds were supposed to be safe, and a lot of the demand for them was by conservative investors like uh, pension funds and insurance companies, which liked them because the maturity and risk characteristics of those government bonds matched the maturity and risk characteristics of, of the company's own liabilities. They like 10-year government bonds because they look forward to paying out on, on a term insurance policy in 10 years. And they like the fact that uh, values were relatively stable. Now they've learned that these bonds are not safe, secure, and stable. So is the de private demand now gone away, never to come back? Has the European bond market been structurally damaged? The European Central Bank has, in fact, purchased already 20% of all Irish and Portuguese debt. And the interest rates that these countries have to pay are still elevated, still on the order of 6 or 7%. I think, myself, technically nothing prevents the European Central Bank from buying more and more and more and pushing the, the prices of those bonds up and the interest rates on them down to desired levels. Other people worry a lot about the uh, side effects. Uh, they worry about the damage to the European Central Bank's balance sheet if countries, ulti governments ultimately go bust. They worry about what economists refer to as moral hazard for national governments. If the European Central Bank helps Italy by pushing Italy's borrowing costs back down toward German levels, doesn't that just take the pressure off the Italian political class and the politicians to take painful measures. Italian politicians, the argument in Berlin goes, in Frankfurt goes, will only agree to painful measures when their backs are to the wall. And for the um, European Central Bank to allow them to exhale would be exactly the wrong thing to do under present circumstances. So that's why we had this really bizarre and politically uncomfortable situation <coughs> last month where the outgoing president of the European Central Bank, Jean-Claude Trichet, on the right at the top, and the not yet up, uh, in office new president of the European Central Bank, uh, Mario Draghi, on, uh, on the left, jointly wrote a letter that they sent to the Spanish and Italian governments, basically giving them their marching orders, saying you need to do this, 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 and this, and you need to do it quickly if you want support from the European Central Bank. So that's really an uncomfortable situation, right? These uh, technocrats, independent technocrats, writing letters demanding painful economic reforms of governments. I write here, that would be a little bit like Mr. Bernanke telling the super committee uh, to balance the budget or else, and specifying exactly what combination of, of, of revenue enhancement and spending cuts the super committee had to undertake uh, to get his support. So I do think there is another way. Europe has created an, an emergency rescue mechanism, the European Financial Stability Facility. It is called, with a little bit of capital, with the power to negotiate with governments and lend them money to help them out. The obvious solution here is to turn the EFSF into a bank, to give it a bank charter, let the ECB lend to it, and it can turn around and negotiate with the French I, I meant Italian, but French is fine, with the Italian and other uh, borrowing uh, governments, that's what it was established uh, in order to do. So how do I think this is all, all going to play out? Um, he, he who relies on the crystal ball ends up eating, eating ground glass. Um, 
My best guess is that Europe will eventually proceed to Plan E, which means that the European Central Bank does what it takes to support the euro and, and drive borrowing costs back down to tolerable levels in the short run, and that Italy and other countries do the necessary in order to uh, uh, demonstrate their solvency and regain market confidence. Um, I, I think that will ultimately happen because, as I argued before, the alternative is too dire for them, for us, and for the world uh, to contemplate. But I think it will only uh, occur after there has been more volatility and more chaos and more demonstrations of the very high costs that everyone would pay if they don't take these painful steps. There is the possibility, of course, that someone will, will miscalculate. So I uh, argued before that it would be an economic catastrophe for Greece to abandon the euro. It might be able to uh, enhance its export competitiveness and, and grow sometime in the future, but it would pay enormously high costs from doing that in the short run. And yet it's possible that a mistake could be made. They could have a referendum, they almost did, on whether to keep the euro or not. And we don't know how that referendum question is going to be framed. You have propositions on, on, on your state ballot here like we do in California, just not as many as we have in California. It all, you, you know it all depends on, on how the question is framed. Do you want the euro? Um, or or you, you can have the euro or you can have uh, the end of austerity and we'll, we'll, we'll go back to free spending. Given that choice, every Greek would say, let's abandon the euro and, and let the good times roll, but that's not the choice for Greece. It's going to have to tighten its belt either way. So how the question is framed, what the politicians do in parliaments is uncertain. And there could be, you know, there, there, uh, a mistake could be made. So will Greece leave the euro? Uh, if you'd asked me in 2007, uh, actually the, uh, the quote I gave a German newspaper, it was a bit more recently than that, was that the probability of a member leaving the, the euro area is equal to the probability of a meteor hitting the euro tower, the, the building in which the European Central Bank is housed in, um, in Frankfurt. So John Maynard Keynes was famous for uh, in a conversation making the, uh, being accused of inconsistency. And his response wa was, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, you do young man? I've had a <laughs> reminder of that, that politicians can miscalculate and that democracies love their souls, sometimes uh, produce unexpected outcomes. But I would still put the odds of <laughs> Greece leaving the euro over the next 12 months at no more than 10%. So I'm not the only person who thinks about this. Um, you can go to Intrade and, and, and put your money down on the odds of, of the likelihood of Greece leaving the euro. Uh, a country currently using the euro will announce their intention to drop it by midnight Eastern time, 31 December. 2012, and you can see that this, the probability implied by the price of the contract is 46%. So I guess if I believe this, I haven't put any money down yet, but it, 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 it's clear uh, which of these contracts I should buy. So um, let, me, let me stop there. I have left many, um, many potential questions unanswered, and I'm happy to hear some of them. Professor Eichengreen has agreed to uh, take some questions, so uh, just go ahead and start. Okay, um, this is in regards to uh, Greece leaving the, uh, Euro, the Euro system. Um, why would Greece leaving, why would that lead to foreign banks pulling all their money out of Greece? So the question was, why would foreign banks pull all their money out of Greece uh, if, if they anticipated Greece would be leaving the Euro? Um, it's not only foreign banks. Right, well, just anybody. Why, why would anybody pull their money out of Greece? Because the 
express purpose of reintroducing the drachma is uh, in order to use the drachma exchange rate to try to make Greek goods and services more competitive. So part of the problem that, that Greece is in is it doesn't export very much that other people want to buy. That its costs are too high and, and that they have risen much faster than productivity has risen in Greece over the course uh, of the last 10 years. Historically, countries have gotten into that bind from time to time. Latin American countries over the years have had populist governments that have won re-election by giving lots of goodies to the public. They end up with a problem of, of competitiveness and that has to be fixed. So how can it be fixed? Uh, really in, in two ways. One is by internal devaluation, which is that I, ag I agree to have my pay cut by 5% or 10% or if you think like Hans Werner Sinn, 44%. But there, there are big problems to getting that done. Uh, I'll do it if everybody else does it. Do you agree to cut your pay by 44% at the same time I do? So there is kind of the equivalent of, uh, you know, it's like you can get everybody to get up uh, an hour earlier in the, in, is it an hour earlier or an hour later in the winter? Or you can go to daylight savings time and just set all the clocks back. Um, you can jump down the exchange rate and reduce costs in terms of euros all at once and you and I don't have to agree on anything. So that's the argument for if you have a national currency and a competitiveness problem, devaluing your currency is a way uh, of making your goods more competitive. And, and, and when, when people know that, they know, they know what the intention is. Everybody knows why there is a discussion now about reintroducing the drachma. If the, your, your bank account is going to be worth 44% less in terms of euros tomorrow, well, let me move my, my bank account into a, a, a bank that will still be in the euro area tomorrow before it's too late. So that's basically the, uh, the bank run story. Uh, what should care here in the US about the crisis of 10 euros? So the question is, why should we care uh, here in the U.S. about the crisis in Europe? Uh, the euro area is one of the three biggest economies in the world, along with the United States and, and, and China. They are one of our largest trading partners, uh, more immediate. Th so, so if they uh, descend into a recession, which is all but certain at this point, or worse yet, into a deep recession, which I think can still be headed off, that's going to be bad for U.S. firms, U.S. exporters who sell goods to Europe. More important than uh, that, I think, is the financial linkages, that U.S. banks lend money to European banks. So U.S. banks proudly say, we don't hold much Greek paper. We don't have very many Greek or Italian bonds but they lend money to BNP Paribas, which does own that stuff. So if BNP Paribas gets into trouble, Citigroup gets into trouble, Bank of America gets into trouble. Um, I think those are the, uh, the principal reasons. It seems to, to me very hard to imagine that, that even our current disappointing economic recovery could be maintained if uh, Europe has a, a, a financial crisis and a, and a deep recession. You mentioned the, a potential short-term solution to Vladimir Putin and the issue of the European Central Bank and so on, by crippling the dollar. And you did that for Powell and you've done stabilized the situation, you did pour out market choice and so on. And then you also suggested that the European Central Bank has the value of telling the Fed rising to be stable and might even be able to make a little bit of a profit what makes you think that the market could be so willing to go back to the high and dead and value it as anything but another great value? So could people at the top hear that? Um, so it's a good question. My view is that what the European Central Bank would be engaging in is a holding action. It would be helping to finance European governments, which uh, 
are trying to narrow their budget deficits but can't eliminate enormous budget deficits overnight without you know, severely injuring their own economies. The European Central Bank can finance them at reasonable interest rates for a period of time. And then the governments in question have to demonstrate that they're ready to do the right thing and to put in place the painful but necessary policy reforms. And if the second thing happens also, then the markets would have reason to be reassured. And then the European Central Bank would uh, make a profit on the operation. So that's why this is uh, like a game of, game of chicken. Uh, another analogy would be uh, mutually assured destruction, you know, as, as a way of uh, maintaining the peace during the Cold War, that the European Central Bank doesn't want to uh, support the Italian government until the Italian government demonstrates its commitment to these painful reforms. But the Italian government can't demonstrate commitment to painful reforms all on one day. There's, you know, the new cabinet in Italy was only named yesterday. It needs some time and breathing space. So there's a real problem here uh, of getting the pieces to, uh, to work together. I think the European Central Bank has to swallow hard and move first and take a risk. Um, and I, I worry that the euro area won't survive if, if it doesn't. Am I confident that it will? I had that slide uh, a moment ago. I, I, I think that it, it will do little in the short run. The situation will deteriorate further. People will grow more alarmed and the European Central Bank will um, realize that it's got to take aggressive action. Uh, that's my best guess of how things will play out. Well, so uh, it, it, it's a very good question. I think I, I, I would frame it a little bit differently. Europe as a whole doesn't have an export problem, or the Eurozone as a whole doesn't have an export problem. Its trade is balanced. Southern Europe exports too little, and Northern Europe exports too much. And uh, I don't know if that's a, is that an unhealthy thing. Yes, it's unhealthy because their finances are still separated, but in the U.S., uh, the state of Washington exports a lot more, thank Boeing and Microsoft, than the state of fill-in-the-blank. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't think there is an export problem, al although I do think uh, uh, a lower value uh, of the euro would be helpful, given that Europe is staring into the abyss. It's staring at the prospect uh, of a recession. But another way to frame your question would be, isn't what Europe needs a, a healthy dose of inflation? One effect of which might be to push the euro down uh, against the dollar. If you think back to that example of uh, Italian debt arithmetic that I gave you before, Italy needs, to, you know, in, in order to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio, Italy uh, need, needs a, a growth rate of nominal income nominal GDP, that's uh, at least as high as uh, the nominal interest rate that it has to pay. So I have been arguing the ECB should step in and deal with that nominal interest rate. Maybe it can do something about the rate of nominal GDP growth by pushing up the inflation rate in what would be a, a healthy way under present circumstances. So I now get hate mail from Germany <laughs> because I've said this <laughs> in some European Newspapers. I must therefore be saying the right thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know enough about this to ask you this question, but I did wonder about the uh, effect of higher uh, higher national uh, income. Would that have any implications on the security of the country? Well, so the uh, the Irish problem is special uh, as I 
uh, alluded to very briefly uh, in the course of the presentation. Ireland did not have the same kind of competitiveness uh, problem as uh, the southern European countries because it was able to boost productivity, labor productivity, quite successfully over the course of the last decade. The problem it had was a big housing boom. This will sound familiar, a big housing bubble that burst, that brought down the banks that had lent all the money to households and real estate developers. And then the decision was taken basically to, for the government to assume responsibility, financial responsibility, for the money that the banks had borrowed. Not only the deposits, but the bonds that they had issued to fund their operations. So um, that's where the, uh, the Irish debt crisis comes from. I don't know that it really has first order implications for what happened in, in Greece, where the nature of the crisis was different. Not uh, a private sector housing bubble like in Ireland, but a public sector spending binge. Um, I think more the causality went the other way, that when things really went south in, in, in Greece, and finally this year there was a recognition that uh, Greek debt would have to be restructured, people who held those Greek bonds would only get 50 cents on the euro, or maybe less, people began to wonder about these Irish bonds again. So the issue of, of uh, whether those bonds are going to be paid off in full or not is back in, in the public debate in Ireland. Why should the Irish taxpayer have to pay people who lent money recklessly to Irish banks where Greek taxpayers don't have to repay money to people who lent the Greek government money so recklessly. So the, I, I, I think the fact that there are, is now going to be the, these write downs of, of Greek debt is unavoidable. It's part of ultimately resolving the Greek crisis, but it's been another factor that's unsettled conditions Europe wide recently. Nobody knows which government bonds are, are going to be written down now and which ones are safe, and that applies to the, uh, the bank bonds guaranteed by the government in Ireland. Gentleman in the blue shirt. So the question was about um, contagion from, from Europe to the United States. If the uh, uh, failure of a small to medium-sized financial institution in 2008 called um, uh, Lehman Brothers in the United States could infect Europe, could transfer across the Atlantic, why couldn't the uh, same thing now operate in reverse? And I think the answer is it could operate in reverse, and that's precisely what happened to MF Global. I don't think you have to go to derivatives. MF Global borrowed a lot of money in order to buy uh, uh, Italian and Spanish bonds in the expectation that everything would be worked out by now and, and the prices of those bonds would have already gone up and, and they got hammered. There were some other problems there we're learning about now as well, but that's the, the relevant portion. So in terms of thinking about contagion, I guess I would distinguish two scenarios. One is Greece goes down, which is happening. You know, they're going to write that debt down very severely. But the problems of Greece have been knowledge to everybody for going on two years now. And banks have been able to get out of the way of those problems. I don't think MF Global or any other US financial institution at this late stage has significant positions in Greek bonds. But then there's Italy and Spain and France, who, you know, where, who, who was it? It was Moody's this time that hit the wrong button and issued the downgrade warning, uh, or issued the downgrade of French government debt erroneously um, at the end of last week, so they're preparing it. We know, if it's the big countries and not only 
Greece, there's no way that U.S. financial institutions are going to be able to stay out of the way. Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, how much of this story also applies to Asia? I think probably the um, Asia would be dragged down as well by uh, an even more severe, severe crisis in Europe. You know, dragged down is a relative term, of course. The Chinese growth rate would fall from its current 9%. So uh, by, by how... How much, no one knows, but uh, Asia would be hit as well. I think the relative importance of different channels would be different, that um, the financial channel, the financial contagion would be less because Asian banks do less business in Europe. American banks do more business in Europe. But Asian countries rely on, on Europe for their merchandise exports. Europe is their single largest market, so that's the channel through which they would be hit. Do they have an interest in helping to avert the worst? And the answer is yes, if they can figure out a way to do it. So um, last month's, or I guess it was still this month's earlier proposal, was that the Chinese government, uh, uh, the Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund, along with those uh, of India and Brazil and, and, and Russia, Goldman Sachs lumped these countries together and now they're paying the price, that these countries should lend money to the European Financial Stability Facility so it could lend money to the troubled governments. And, and the government of China rightly said, uh, actually, uh, the, the phrase they used was, I forget which official said it is, we are not stupid money. <laughs> so they want to see the relevant reforms, just like the European Central Bank before they do anything, and if the relevant reforms occur, it's not clear that they have to take any special action. The other player here that we haven't talked about is the International Monetary Fund. So another possible way in which uh, uh, Spain and Italy could be helped is by proper IMF programs. Uh, Spain is already being helped to an extent uh, uh, in that fashion, but the idea is that the IMF is in the business uh, of negotiating a contract with troubled countries. The countries sign a letter of intent about what they commit to do, and if they do it on a quarterly basis, they get, get a concessionary loan from the IMF. Problem being, the IMF doesn't have enough money to deal with a big country like Italy, much less Italy, Spain, France, Belgium. Na name your favorite troubled European economy. So that's somewhere where um, China and India and Brazil could presumably help. They could put some money in a trust fund that the IMF would administer and, and loan to these countries subject to conditions. Countries don't fall, default on their loans to the IMF if they can help it because they're defaulting on their loans to the shareholders of the IMF, which mean people like the U.S. government. So that might be a relatively safe way for the Asians to help. We're going to have to bring it to a close. How about one last question? The person in the right in the back has been uh, great patient. Uh, first would be, why did the European Union deny their package if they're on package so that the Fed So, so the second one uh, is easy. No, I don't think they will be able to. And that's why I think they, uh, nobody wants to put more, more of their own money into this bailout fund with the high uncertainty perva that pervades in Europe. The European Central Bank uh, is in a position to do so. There are no, no limits on its ability to put money in the EFSF if the EFSF is given a bank charter. The European Central Bank is in the business of lending to banks, and that's 
what most of us think a normal central bank should do. It should be a lender of last resort to uh, borrowers in distress. Uh, it's more complicated when the borrower is a government rather than a bank that you regulate. You know, you can send in the bank, the Fed can send in the bank inspectors, close down the bank, uh, replace its management if it wants to keep it open. Uh, so we had this funny episode where the ECB has now almost replaced the management of the country of Italy. But it, you know, it's, it's problematic, harder to accomplish, and you're, it's not clear you want to put a central bank in that. Position. So the only way the, that's going to work is with the ECB lending, I think, to the EFSF. The other question was technical. I hesitate to end on a technical one, especially one that I don't know the answer to. But the question was, why, were, why was everyone in Europe so intent on having a, quote, voluntary debt exchange where the banks were hit over the head by policymakers until they agreed to take new bonds from the Greek government worth only half the value of their own bonds. And because they agreed, because it was voluntary, the insurance contracts on the old bonds, the credit default swaps, were not triggered. Why did they go down that route? Despite the fact that that, that ended up destroying the CDS market or its value in Europe. So there are uh, two possible explanations for that. CDS written on, on Greek debt are very, very small, but uh, European regulators are terrified by them. They thought that uh, triggering those contracts would uh, impose a very high cost on whomever had issued them. BNP Credit uh, Paribas had issued them. I'm, I'm repeating a rumor here that you should not repeat as fact. <laughs> and uh, that institution would have been placed at risk, so therefore we couldn't trigger them. L lots of other people think that those risks are not so concentrated and, and triggering them wouldn't have been so disastrous. Another explanation would be the banks that had issued them are, are, have power. They lobbied to prevent the debt exchange from being done in such a way that would have cost them even more money if they had had to pay out on, on the credit default swaps that they had issued. But this is something that may, the answer to which maybe we will learn someday. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Airport where the commuter planes go from, and you know what that's like. Yeah.